Just uh, something to make you aware of. If you haven't done this, uh, our church actually has an app. It's available uh, online, and uh, you can download it. It's a great way for us to be able to notify you in an emergency if for weather reasons we had to cancel a service. It also gives you access to all of our resources uh, very easily without having to go online to do it. So if you'd like access to that, just um, uh, go wherever it is that you download your apps and look for it, and you'll be able to find it and download it. This morning we're starting a series called The Why Factor. If you've got little children, you know they're really good at asking their favorite question, which is why, and when you answer, they follow it up with why, and then when you answer, they follow it up with why, and <laughs> to the point that you eventually get to the spot where you go, I don't know, or you say, I don't care. <laughs> or I heard one parent say, because I'm stupid, and that's not what we want. By the way, here's, uh, if you're interested, I don't know if you are, but if you're interested, here's a way to actually respond differently. You, instead of just trying to answer the question, try this. Say, why do you think that is? And then they're going to tell you stuff you probably ought to hear and uh, be worth knowing, find out how they think. We're in Genesis, the first chapter today, because we're going to look at the big why. Eventually, we all ask this question, not just why am I here in this room, but why am I here, period. And in order to find the answer to that, I think we have to go back to our beginning. And so in Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the, in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Uh, sometimes we ask the question, why, uh, when something didn't go our way. In fact, I think we tend not to ask so much when things do go well, but when they don't go so well. Or why, why we weren't selected for something. Like, why wasn't I chosen for that job or that school or that club or that organization, and those answers can be somewhat complicated and, and sometimes difficult to hear. A lot of the reasons that we're in a place where we are is, is actually as a result of decisions that we have made. And asking yourself why you made those decisions, that can be the source of a lot of wisdom to helping you understand who you are and how you process life. So like I said, the good times, we don't tend to ask a lot of why questions. But when things get difficult, the why question comes up very quickly. And uh, uh, the ultimate why question is, why are we here? And some people have answered that question by saying, well, we're just an accident. The right molecules in the right environment at the right temperature began a series of steps that eventually led to this. And uh, there are people who believe that and as best they can live consistently with that thought process. Uh, there are others who believe that we are here not by accident, but by design, that God created us. Genesis reveals that God is a creator, that he creates a universe, he creates a world, he creates a garden, he creates people. And here's the point I'd like you to see is, from the biblical perspective, God created us on purpose and with purpose. We're not an afterthought, we're not an accident, he was intentional, so he created us on purpose and with purpose. And there's clues in the creation story to help us understand what this purpose is. So we find out that God actually interacts with uh, humans in the Genesis story. In the third chapter, it reveals that he comes in the cool of the day and he walks with them and talks with them. This is kind of cool because it helps us see that we're not just a, a project that God created, but... He's looking for relationship, which is this point, is that we are here to be in relationship with God and with others. God doesn't just create a project and then leave it on the shelf. He comes and he walks and he talks with those first humans that he creates. 
It shows us that God is not a monster to try to appease, and he's not a force that either is to be used or avoided. He reveals himself as creator. He reveals himself as father. And what's interesting is that here's Adam, and he has God, and he has work, and he has all the animals around him, and God says, it's not good for man to be alone. It's absolutely astonishing to me how many people think that because they have God, they don't need anybody else. And God said, that's not good. And God describes that as being alone. We are created for relationship with God and relationship with others. And when those things are not in place, God says, it's not good. It's not a condemnation as though we're doing something wrong. He's just saying, you were created for relationship. And if you're not experiencing that, it's always going to feel like less to you. And so we're created for relationship. Uh, secondly, we are here to exercise authority. We are here to exercise authority. Here's some more clues in the creation story. God makes humankind, this, the phrasing is fascinating in this. He says, he makes us in his image so that they may rule. That is really interesting to me. And, and the concept of rule has to do with exercising authority that we're not just a product of the forces and in the environments around us, that we are not to take the negative things that have happened in our lives and allow them to define us or determine what our responses are in life, that we are not just an animal who tries to survive by instinct alone. God says we are created to operate in and exercise authority. Where to, and so the question is, well, where do I get that authority? And the answer is, our authority derives from being under the one who has all authority. There's a great story in the New Testament of a Roman soldier who came to Jesus. He was a centurion, and his daughter was sick and about to die. And he asked Jesus to help, and Jesus said, I'll come to your house. And, and the centurion said this amazing thing. He said, look, I'm a person who is under authority, and I have authority. And my, the people who are over me, if they give me a command, I obey it. All they have to do is say it. And the people who are under me, if they, I give them a command, they obey it. All I have to do is say it. So I know all you have to do is just say it, and my daughter will be healed. And it impressed Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, I have not seen this quality of faith anywhere in the land. What is he acknowledging? He's acknowledging that one of the ways, or maybe the most important way, that we begin to exercise authority is by paying attention to the words that we speak. I may be the only person in the room who has negative self-talk, but I can give myself quite a workover. Back in the days when I was... Uh, uh, able to ski down a mountain <laughs> on purpose. I can remember getting caught on a mogul hill where I was going out of control. I mean, my friend was there, and he watched this whole thing develop, and there actually became a moment when I was in the air, off the ground, and the closest part of my body to the ground was my head, and the furthest part away from the ground was my skis. And I can remember what I was thinking about myself in that moment. And I, do, I was not thinking, well, this is interesting. <laughs> I was thinking, Robert, you're an idiot. <laughs> Why did you ever think you could go down this hill? Who do you think you are? You're going to die. And it's, oh, it's your own fault. Has anybody ever said anything to yourself like that? Yeah. And what are we doing? Are, is, is that exercising authority? It is not. It is not. It's amazing the things that we say that reveal that we think we have no influence in our own lives or in the world around us. We're fascinated by the fact that God, when he creates everything that is, it starts with words. God said, let there be light, which is really, really cool because the scientists tell us that in the beginning there was a big bang. Bang. They focus on the audio side. God focuses on the illumination side. The audio was, let there be. And the explosion that happened, which when I was a kid, I was always confused. 
Because how can we have light before we have a sun? Am I the only one who thought that? Or maybe I was just a weird kid. I, well, I was a weird kid, but that's another thing. And how do we get light before we get sun? And yet that's, we know now that's exactly what happened. You do get light before you get a sun. And it all begins with God speaking something. And so we have to pay attention to what it is that we say. You have been created in the image and likeness of God, so pay attention to the words that you speak. Now, this doesn't mean you have all authority. It's not for you to be the boss of everybody. There's a lot of difference between authority and trying to control people or acting like a tyrant. There's a difference between authority and abuse. And a lot of folks in our world don't understand that. But if you want to start exercising authority, Start with yourself and pay attention to the words that you say. We're here to exercise authority, but we're also here to be fruitful. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And obviously that has to do with reproducing more humans, which it turns out we've been pretty good at. I don't know the exact number of humans on this, fam uh, on this planet, but I can tell you that we're doing a pretty good job of filling the earth. But this word means more than just to replicate or reproduce. It has to do with cultivating. It has to do with something becoming fruitful. To, to, to achieve a kind of capacity that it includes its potential. We're to facilitate growth and development through the attention that we give and the actions that we take. That, um, this is another thing I'm not good at. I'm not good at taking care of plants. Um, I'm referred to as a serial killer of plants. And uh, I'm sure in plant world, I'm like in the top 10 most wanted people. Uh, what happens in our house is uh, a plant gets ignored and then we notice that it's not doing well and then I'll water it and my wife will water it and then we drown it. So it goes from extreme to extreme and very few plants tolerate that well. But lots of people believe that... Um, for example, like with our, our children, we want to exercise authority. One thing our kids really need is parents with authority, but not just authority to get them to comply, authority that helps them become what they're capable of being. And uh, there's lots of parents, they think their goal is just to create compliant little creatures. Well, first of all, good luck with that. And, and second of all, if all our goal is is to make them compliant, then all that tells them is if someone is bigger than them or more powerful than them, then they get to decide what they get to do in life. And that's not the message we want to send to our kids. You will have trouble with them by the time they're four years old if that's your goal. And so what we want them to do is to learn how to be discerning, to learn how to assess, to, to learn how to plan, to learn how to persevere, to, to learn how to think through some things. And, and this requires more skills than just because I said so. No, don't get me wrong. There's times when because I said so is required. But the older they get, the less that option works. And our goal as a parent is not just to make the house quiet and easy. Our goal as a parent is that when this child leaves the house, that they are able to navigate the realities of life with a sense of confidence and a sense of purpose. That they don't, they don't recoil against it and they're not fearful of it. It doesn't mean that they can control everything, but they're willing to try. That's an amazing thing for a parent to give a child. And so this is the idea of being fruitful. Not just creating compliance. So this is not only true within our families, but it's in, true in our communities. Uh, we are called to, be, to help our communities become fruitful. This idea, the, the word uh, uh, culture actually comes from cultivate. What is it that you're giving your attention to grow, not just within your family, but within the community in which you live? Some people look at things like bankers and, and they'll go, well, uh, bankers are just in society to take advantage of, of other people's money so that they can make money on it. Well, that's one way to look at it. But people who are in the loaning institution often perceive the, the way that what there it is that they're doing by saying that we're using collected resources and investing them into the community so we can create opportunities for employment and products that make the world a better place. That's cultivating. That's being fruitful. That's growing something intentionally. Uh, teachers, 
Their goal can just be to try to get this class through the test at the end of the year, or they could be trying to train young minds so that they can master information and influence the world for good. Or mechanics, you probably know too, I have no mechanical ability. Some of you are sitting here today and go, it's becoming obvious why you're a pastor. You can't do anything else. <laughs> and, and that's close to true, but mechanics can repair equipment. I can't repair equipment. I used to take it apart and then take it to a mechanic, and I've discovered that they prefer I not do that. Just bring it to them the way it is. And, and a mechanic can take something and repair it so we don't have to go through the increase of expense of a total replacement, which allows me to use those resources that could have gone to replacing it to do other things that are beneficial for my family and for the community. It's absolutely amazing. Psychologists, doctors, public servants, diplomats, nurses, artists, musicians, vocalists, scientists, biologists, pharmacists, farmers, on and on and on it goes. We are all here to use the gifts that God has given us to cultivate, to create a fruitful environment. This is a fascinating thing. And, and I've heard the, some pastors say this. That they'll say something like this. You know, the highest calling there is in life is to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think the highest calling there is in life is for you to do what God called you to do. I think it's entirely possible that the worst thing that could happen in our world is that everyone becomes a pastor. <laughs> I'm not sure that would improve things a lot. But how incredible when you use your skills and your abilities to make a difference in your life and in your world. That's a game changer. And that's something that we should pay attention to. So God creates every day for six days, and at the end of every day, he acknowledges that what he's created is good. But this is fascinating to me. I really hadn't thought about this until this week. He says it's good. So he creates all the animals. That's good. Creates all the trees. That's good. Every day. That's good. Creates humans. He says that's really good. Okay. But then he doesn't tell Adam and Eve, now you're in a museum. Don't touch anything. Just kind of walk through creation and acknowledge, well, that's impressive. Look at that tree. Now, there's a tree. Okay. Has anybody ever been in a museum? They're fascinating places. I took my wife one time to the Museum of Modern Art. And the reason I went there is because I loved her. <laughs> I, that's the only reason I went. And I do believe that my reward in heaven is greater because of that. <laughs> there were things in there. How it got defined as art is something of a mystery to me. But I remember there's this one painting. It's a, it's a famous painting. If I told you, you'd know what it was. It's a famous painting, and, and it's on the wall. And they've got this, this line, an arc, semicircle. And you are allowed to get as close as the line. And that's as close as you can get because they don't want anything to happen to this masterpiece. And I watched as my wife put her toes right over the line and leaned forward as much as she could. The security guard in the corner was kind of flinching. He was just anxious that she was going to either fall in or do something that she shouldn't do. But she was fascinated. And some people think that this is what God has created human beings to do, to just walk through the world world, stay behind the line and go, well, that's a great mountain right there. That's a beautiful lake. Look at that sunset. And what God says is that when he creates, this is fascinating to me, when he creates, he creates things in raw material and calls it good. And then he tells us to apply our capacities and our abilities, <laughs> this is really cool, to improve the good stuff he made. That is unbelievable. Like, who would think of that except God? You are not in a museum. He's given raw material in your life that he wants you to use your gifts and your abilities and your capacities and your talents to actually take that raw material and produce something even more or something greater out of it. It's absolutely fascinating. So, um, when, they, when they saw that as, as their command, right, you're to be fruitful, you're, you're, to, be, you're to exercise authority, it inspired them, like Adam and Eve would wake up in the morning and they would feel inspired, they would feel motivated, they would, they would wake up with energy because there's all this, this possibility. 
something has happened to human beings now. Where when we see all of the possibility, we're not necessarily inspired anymore. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed. Or sometimes we do the mathematical equation of the distance between us and what's possible, and then we feel badly about that distance. And we start saying negative things about ourselves because we're not there yet. And we become fearful that if I try for that and I fail, what will that mean about me? Before the fall, all of that possibility inspired us, and after the fall, all of that possibility overwhelms us. If you're feeling overwhelmed today, it is not because you are less than what God created you to be. It's because you are seeing the possibility, but you're not seeing what God has invested in you to move towards it. So how do, how do we do that? Well, I would like to say that just because you listen to this talk, you'll be all better now. And that's actually not how it works. So I want to take a couple minutes just to go through a really powerful passage of Scripture in Micah, the sixth chapter. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. This idea of acting justly, we usually interpret it as just, just do the right thing. But that word actually has a very complicated meaning in the original language. And it has to do with, if, if you were going before a judge, you would have to prepare your case. And the work you would do to prepare your case so that you would get the outcome in the court that you would want, that's what that word just means. It means that you think something through. It means that you present the best possibilities. You don't just walk in and hope something happens. You're intentional about it. Um, don't just do the easiest thing in life. Don't just do what other people expect you to do in life. Don't just do something because you're intimidated. Think things through. And do the thing that you think is the best thing. Do the thing that should be done. Like there is times when we, we know we should speak up, but we just stay quiet. There are times when we should say no, and we don't know how to say no. We learned it when we were two years old, and some of us have forgotten it. Or maybe it's making a commitment. We just run away from commitment because we don't want to obligate ourselves. Our, our definition of freedom is not being responsible to anything or anyone. And that is a lousy definition of that word. So think it through. Act justly. But also to love mercy. And this obviously has to do with showing kindness to others and, and, and showing kindness to those who are in need, someone who is without, and we extend something towards them. We have a whole ministry in our church devoted to this, benevolence ministry, where people who are going through a financial crisis where we can try to assist and help them. But this mercy also has to do with forgiveness. It's an act of mercy to forgive. And this is interesting. This is where it gets challenging because it feels like there's a conflict between doing the right thing and forgiving someone for doing the wrong thing. Like, if you show mercy, is that another form of injustice because you're letting that perpetuate? And if you only live by mercy, then what we do doesn't matter anyway. So how, do we, how do we address the tension about acting justly and loving mercy? And I think the best way is to actually look at Christ to look at the life of Jesus, because we see someone who acts justly and loves mercy. Uh, what's interesting is that he never refuses to say that a wrong thing is a wrong thing. In our culture, that's just the most abominable thing you can do. You're not allowed to say anything is wrong. And you don't see Jesus backing away from that. He challenged people's values and he challenged people's behaviors. And his concept of mercy was not just you turn a blind eye and it doesn't matter. He believed that there was a price to pay for injustice. But what made him different was he was willing to pay the price. That's what made him different. Jesus didn't come into our world to tell us that what we are doing doesn't matter. He came to pay the price for all those selfish and foolish choices that we have made. And then more than that, he came to not just take our sin away, but to give us his life in its place. He acts justly and he loves mercy. And then walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly. Oh, okay, 
Here's a, here's a sentence. I'm going to say it, and then we're all going to repeat it, okay? I don't know it all. Ready? I don't know it all. Somebody next to you never heard you say that before. Right? Let's, just, let's try that again. I don't know it all. Because you don't. Okay? Here's another sentence. I'm going to say it, and then we'll all say it together. I could be wrong. Right? <laughs> let's try it. Ready? I could be wrong. That was less people. <laughs> there are some people who will say, well, I might not know it all, but I'm not wrong. <laughs> and humility says, there are things I don't know, and some of the things that I think I know, I could be at least partly, if not completely, wrong about. And that puts you in a position where you can now listen and learn. Here's a little test for you, okay? Can you think of something that in the last few years you've kind of changed your opinion about because of information that you've learned? And if the answer is no, it is not because that you're intellectually challenged, it's because that you're not walking humbly. We don't have to rethink everything all the time. But we have to be willing to acknowledge there are things I don't know and there are things that I could be wrong about. Or is there, is there something in your life where you've actually kind of changed, changed some of the actions that you're taking? You're, you're approaching something differently. You've made changes in your life maybe financially or relationally or physically. See, the way to get better in life is to Walk humbly in life. That's how we learn from other people. And in our world, we're so afraid that we're going to look stupid. And what we need to know is we can all grow. We can all learn. God has created you on purpose and with purpose. And he desires to be in a relationship with you. And he desires you to be in relationship with others. And you can start that right now. Like if you feel isolated from God, all it takes is accepting the invitation he's already accepted. You can do that today. We're, we're called to, to be in relationship. We're also created to be in authority. Just surrender the idea forever that you're just a byproduct of the forces that are beyond your control in life. You are not. You're created in the image and the likeness of God. And he intends for And it starts with the things you say to yourself. And then, what can you do to help move something towards the possibility that is within it? Those are all things that God has for us today. Those are all things he wants to do in our lives. It's why we're here. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, um, this is something that we can really struggle with. Especially if we've been through some really difficult seasons in our life where we feel a lot less than what we thought we were. Would you help us just to be open to you and to others in our lives to direct and correct us so we walk in humility. To be willing to pay attention to the things that we say, that maybe the quickest thing that comes out of our mouth is not the truest thing. And would you help us to find ways to connect with you? If not placed us in a museum, we're part of your family. And you've given us such incredible potential. Would you help us live that out? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.